if you will, and turn with me back to that portion of text which we read just a few moments ago. A very emotional experience, I'm sure, for Joseph, and it was clearly a very emotional experience for his brothers, too, as they are fearful for their very lives. We're in Genesis chapter 50, and we are looking at the few verses that bring us almost to the end of the chapter. When Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us and will certainly requite us all the evil which we did unto him. Gracious Heavenly Father, we pray for your blessings on the going forth of your word this morning, that it would not return unto you void, but that it would accomplish that which you please and prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. This is your word, Father. It is powerful, it is supernatural, it penetrates the heart. I pray, Father, that you might use it today to penetrate each of our hearts, that we might understand and believe and obey that which you have caused to be written herein. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You recall that the last time we were together, of course, the last two weeks we've been having specials, and so uh, thinking back three weeks ago, uh, we were looking at the death and burial of Jacob in chapter 49, verses 33 through chapter 50, verse 14. And we learned seven different lessons in those 
group of verses there. Number one, when we're in fellowship with God, God will see to it that everything we need to do will get done. Verse 33 had told us when Jacob had made an end of commanding his son. You know, very interesting that God lets us live just so long as he has a purpose for us here in this life. If you're still alive, that means that God has a purpose for you. If you're still alive, that means that God has a plan for you. If you're still alive, there are things that God is bringing into your life to bring you to Christ or to transform you into the image of his son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing ever falls short in the plan of God. And you know, as we looked at that, we saw that even when we're not in fellowship, God always accomplishes his purpose by another means or by another person. The things that God could have used you to do and you have decided you will not do them, God will accomplish his plan for he is sovereign. He will use someone else or some other means to accomplish that plan. The second thing that we learned was that the loss of a loved one is always painful even when you know that he or she was a believer. Joseph has lost his father in this passage here. And he weeps for that. And he does many wonderful things to prepare the body for burial. But you know when we've lost a loved one, even when we are believers, that loss does not ease the pain of the parting. The loss is even more painful when it's the loss of a child. And we saw that with the illustration of David and the first child that he had by Bathsheba being smitten by God and dying because that was the child of adultery. A child that was born out of wedlock when David committed adultery with Bathsheba and then sent her husband into battle with specific commands to make sure that Uriah the Hittite was killed in battle. The third lesson that we learned is a royal funeral does not determine your final end, either temporal or eternal. You can have a very beautiful funeral here below and there are um, undertakers all over the United States and around the world who are making billions of dollars on the funeral industry. And they are making the corpse look very, very beautiful. And there are many apostate preachers getting up and saying words of comfort and platitude to the effect that, well, you know, this person is in a better place right now. But if that person is not a believer, they are not in a better place right now. If that person is not a Christian, they are in hell. That's what the scripture declares. So no matter how beautiful the funeral, it doesn't really determine you as an individual what your final end will be. There is no man that hath power over the spirit to retain the spirit, neither hath he power in the day of death, and there is no discharge in that war. Neither shall wickedness deliver those that are given to it. Ecclesiastes 8 and verse 8. And so as we saw those three lessons, we saw that Jacob had a reason in his death for giving hope to those who followed after him. There was hope for Jacob beyond the grave because he had faith in the true and living God. We saw he's listed as one of the heroes of faith in Hebrews chapter 11, the three patriarchs that we have seen in this book of Genesis, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are all listed there in that chapter by faith. Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. By faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith Jacob, when he was dying, and that's what we saw last week, blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning upon the top of his staff. These are men of faith. The reason that they leave hope to those who follow them is because of faith and the promises of God. That chapter closes with these words, These all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise, God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. And that, of course, was the only reason that any of us have hope beyond the grave. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, 
faith in the unfailing promises of God offered to us through our Lord Jesus Christ. We saw other lessons, interesting though not as important as those first three, but never assume that you have untested rights without first gaining permission of the one in authority. Joseph is second in command over all the land of Egypt, and yet he asks permission to go back and bury his father in the land of Canaan. Number five, don't be surprised if you have to give evidence that you mean good on your word, and Joseph has to do that as you see the group of people that went with him. We saw Pharaoh's personal bodyguard going up. We saw the elders of the house of Egypt. That's his legal and political advisors. We saw the elders of all Egypt. That's the governmental officers for the whole land. But we didn't see Pharaoh going up or members of his family. We saw the Jewish children were left behind. We saw all the herds and flocks were left behind. And Pharaoh also sends a large army with Joseph, both for his security and safety and to assure that he will return. And we saw the parallel with Moses at a later date. Lesson six was God can use even an unbelieving government for his good and for a testimony for himself. We saw that this was a testimony to the people of the land when they wept for Jacob. These Egyptians coming up out of Egypt. And finally, we saw that you need to make sure that you always keep your word. Keep your word to family members. Keep your word to unbelievers, to friends, because you represent the living God who is the God of truth. And so today that brings us to a message from your father. I don't know how many of you have ever received a, a message from your father, a letter from your dad. I went away to school when I was 11 years old, to Stony Brook School for Boys out on Long Island. And uh, yesterday, I can hardly believe it, was my 45th class reunion. I couldn't believe what a bunch of old guys showed up for that reunion. <laughs> 45 years ago, we were 17 and 18 and 19 years old, graduating from that school out on Long Island, and uh, our class actually had the best representation of any class for the number that showed up, the percentage of the class that showed up. I think almost 50% of our class showed up for our 45th reunion. We had a wonderful dinner together last night. I didn't get back here till 1.30 in the morning. But uh, it was, so it was a very long day, leaving early in the morning and then coming back late at night. But you know, um, I look at those men, some of whom are very good friends, and I weep for some of them because some of them are lost. Some of them have walked their own way through life. They had the very best possible prep school education. Many of them went to Ivy League colleges. Many of them are now successful businessmen. But some of them are lost. Some of them who are articulate in their faith in their high school years have now turned their backs on God. You don't know how painful that is for me. These are men with whom I spent five years, eighth grade through twelfth grade. And we lived in the dorm together, we ate together in the dining hall, we played sports together, we went to classes together. We were friends. It was a wonderful day. We had some delightful times. We went sailing. The school owns 41 boats. And they actually teach sailing and marine uh, biology. And so they have boats on the water every day have some very, very nice boats, some large ones as well as small dinghies. And while we were out there on the quietness of the Long Island Sound, I sat and talked with these dear friends. And some of them spoke of their fathers. Two in particular 
spoke of the difficult time that they had had with their fathers and of the lack of communication with their fathers. The message is entitled, A Message from Your Father. Joseph receives here what is purported to be a message from his father. Oh, I can remember back in those days how deeply I longed to hear from home. And what a joy it was when I would receive a letter from my father. I still have every letter that my dad wrote to me while I was in prep school and college and in seminary. And they were written by hand. Letters from my mother. How eagerly I received those letters and read them over and over. A message from your father. Joseph has received here what, at least on the surface, appears to be a message from his father. One whom he loved very much, and we have seen a great deal of that as we've gone through the book of Genesis. And how painful it is not to know whether your father loves you or cares for you. You know, we have a heavenly father one who loves us and who cares for us. We have a father who has written us his letter. He's given us his word. He's told us how much he loves us. He's told us about the inheritance that he has for those who are his children. It's a magnificent letter of love. Don't lose sight of that as we look at the manipulations that the brothers have as they are pretending that Joseph has a message from his father. As we look at this text today, we learn at least seven things. Number one, after death, the implications of reality begin to sink in. That certainly is happening here with the brothers in this text. They suddenly have reality hitting them full in the face. It says, when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us and will certainly requite us all the evil which we did unto him. Maybe you've lost a loved one at some point. Maybe now reality is beginning to set in. It's like the old saying, the chickens come home to roost. The benefits that the departed loved one provided are suddenly not there. Suddenly you are entering the realm of the uncertainty of the future. Suddenly repressed fears come to the surface. Personal responsibility and accountability become more focused. Personal guilt becomes oppressive. Death brings the survivors to a place where they can no longer make up for their past actions. We see that all around us. We see that all the time in our everyday world. Those of us who are older have seen and gone through it many times with loved ones passing on. But the real issue becomes, how will you deal with the stark reality of death? Will you deal with it through human coping mechanisms the methods of psychology and psychiatry, or will you deal with it through the mechanism of faith? You know, there are, there are many kinds of human coping mechanisms that are the, the bread and butter of human psychiatrists and psychologists. They deal with people who are stuffing it. That's repression. They deal with those who are blaming others, with schizophrenia, with emotional collapse and acting irresponsible, with isolationism and withdrawal from other human contact, with those who are going through what's called burnout, or as in the case of Joseph's brothers, who are making up and living under the umbrella 
of an elaborate lie for their own personal protection. Have you ever lived under the umbrella of a lie? You know, those are the kinds of things that all of us tend to do at one time or another. Living a lie. That's what we see Joseph's brothers doing here. That's the human mechanism that they have come up with to try to protect themselves because they're afraid of their brother, Joseph. Or, on the other hand, you can use the way that God has provided. Confession of sin. If you feel that you are guilty for having done something, if you feel that you were wrong in something that you did, the way God says to deal with it is to confess it as sin. Because as we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We can't continue to hold on to our sins. We can't continue to live in the past of what we did that was bad. And our conscience is constantly giving us grief. The book of Hebrews chapter 9 verse 14 says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. The devil wants you to be in that position of constantly mulling over the past, constantly agonizing over what you did, because as long as you don't deal with it God's way, the devil has a handle on you. But as we confess our sins, as we repent and turn from our sins, we cannot change the past, but we can receive forgiveness for the past. And that's what God wants each of us here today to understand. That through faith in Christ and through the cleansing blood of Christ, we have not only the, the washing away of our sins, but we have the purification of our consciences. Oh, if you are going through the agony of what if or how bad I was, understand that Jesus paid for those sins on Calvary's cross. And he gives you freedom. He gives you life. He gives you a new hope for the future. Don't use the human methods of trying to deal with sin. You can walk forward by faith even if you don't know the future. You see, as we look at this passage here today, the brothers don't understand that they're dealing with a brother who has the divine perspective of walking closely in fellowship with the sovereign God who controls history for our good and for his glory. We're not dealing with some kind of a local God. We're not dealing with some kind of a, a slightly stronger than us God. We're not dealing with an impotent God who sits in heaven and wrings his hands hoping it will all turn out right. We are dealing with the sovereign God of the universe who created all things and who controls all things within history. And because they don't understand that they're dealing with a brother who has that perspective, they are filled with thoughts that they would have if they were in Joseph's place. And then they are filled with thoughts concerning themselves. They are filled with fear. They have no hope or interest in the future. They're focused on material things in this life. Because you see, they did not understand forgiveness and cleansing that God eagerly provides and which Joseph in this passage so beautifully displays. So the question becomes, how are you personally dealing with your sins? How are you dealing with the death of loved ones? How are you dealing with the problems that face you right now? Perhaps some kind of a horrible disease. Perhaps some kind of financial crisis. How are you dealing with it? How are you dealing with all the different areas of sin that are in your life? With humanistic coping mechanisms or with God's provision of forgiveness for sins through the death of His Son, our Lord Jesus Christ? Only you can answer that question. And you can continue on living in the misery of that oppression because you're trying to deal with it in a human method 
Or you can live in the glorious light of the peace of God by dealing with it the way God has provided. You've got to make that choice. You make one choice and you will live the rest of your life in misery. You'll make the other choice and we are all accountable for our choices. We've studied that in the past. You make the other choice and you can live in the glorious light of the forgiveness of God and the grace of God and the goodness of God and the cleansing of conscience, the forgiveness of sins. Lesson number two. Oh, how this is expressed for us here in this portion of the text. Sin stirs the imagination. Sin causes us to believe things that are not true. Look at that phrase. They said, Joseph will peradventure hate us and will certainly requite us all the evil which we did unto him. Sin is stirring their imagination. Sin is causing them to believe things that are not true. You see, the brothers saw a possibility and what they believed to be a certainty. There are two things that are listed here. One's a possibility and one is a certainty in their minds. You see, they'd experienced Joseph's kindness for the past 17 years from the time that the family moved to Egypt and Jacob was 130 years old and he stood before Pharaoh and declares that and then we're told that the date of Jacob's death he's 147. So for 17 years, Jacob and all of his sons have lived together on the fat of the land in Egypt. And Joseph has provided for them all this time because Joseph is second in command. So for 17 years they have seen the kindness of Joseph. But you know, because we are all wicked sinners, they still figured that it was possible that maybe that was all fake. Maybe those 17 years, he was hiding his hatred and just biding his time. Joseph will peradventure hate us. There's that possibility. We'd better prepare for it. That might be possible that Joseph really does hate us. Maybe he's just faking it all along, just because Dad was still alive. But you know, they were absolutely certain that he would punish them. You know, they said here, we'll certainly requite us all the evil which we did unto him. Why were they so absolutely certain that Joseph was going to punish them? Because you see, they'd also been watching him for 17 years, executing absolute justice as the second in command in Egypt. He will certainly requite us all the evil which we did unto him. But what they did not understand was that Joseph had already forgiven them. Now, dear people, those of you who've placed your faith in Christ, those of you who know you're on your way to heaven, do you really believe that Christ paid for your sins and that you are forgiven through the blood of Christ? Or do you look forward to the future? He will certainly requite us for our sins. Listen, did Jesus pay for that or did he not? Did Jesus pay for your sins or did he not? You see, we have already received forgiveness. Oh, it's not a license to continue in sin that grace may abound. Paul says, God forbid. How should we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? That's not an excuse for sin, but it is a guaranteed absolute assurance and, and, and a confidence in our hearts that we know that our sins are forgiven. What a blessed promise from the Word of God. And here are the brothers, they don't understand that Joseph has already forgiven them. You see, it's their lack of faith that keeps them from having full fellowship with him, their own brother. You know, it's sort of like many people today who are trying to win God's favor with their good behavior. It's sort of like people who try to win the favor of God by their good works or by keeping the law. And they struggle and they struggle in the flesh all their lives thinking that this is going to please God. The just shall live by faith. That's what God has called us to do. Live by faith. You do not know what the rest of today will bring for you. 
or I for myself. But we trust the one who knows the future, the one who has ordained the future, the one who has our good in mind, the one who has planned for us that which is not only pleasing to him, but will bring joy to our hearts. We serve the sovereign God of the universe. And how sweet it is to trust in Jesus. Just to take him at his word. Oh friends, are you taking him at his word? You see, the brothers didn't understand that. In other words, the brothers did not understand grace. They did not understand the freely offered grace of God to sinners. Christ came into the world to save sinners. Do you understand you're a sinner? Christ came to save sinners. Do you understand that you've disobeyed God? That you've walked in ways that are not pleasing to Him? That you have disobeyed the one who created you? That it was your sins that nailed His Son to the cross? Do you understand that? It is only as you understand that you are a sinner and that you are lost and undone and helpless and not able to make it on your own that you cannot pull yourself up by your own bootstraps that you will cry out to the living God for his mercy and he has mercy with which he will abundantly pardon. And it's found in Jesus Christ. Oh, dear one, how they were deceived by their own sin, caused to believe things that were not true. They did not understand the grace of God. Forgiveness costs you nothing. Salvation comes to you at no cost to you. It's already been paid for you and for me by the death of our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. Sin stirs the imagination and causes us to believe things that are not true when we don't deal with sin the way that God has provided. We come to him confessing that we are sinners. And by his grace he cleanses us. Lesson three. So many good lessons out of this text here. A guilty conscience makes us afraid to personally deal with our sin. Did you know they sent a messenger? They sent a messenger unto Joseph, saying, Thy father did command before he died, saying, So shall ye say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and their sins. Now the brothers do show up in the next verse, but they first send a messenger carrying a message. And there's no indication that this was a message that Jacob left and then had somebody send it after he died. You see, the brothers have a guilty conscience, and a guilty conscience often makes us try to get others involved in covering our sin. They sent a messenger with a lie. The messenger may not have even known that he was carrying a lie, but the brothers obviously sent a messenger who had access to Joseph and who was trusted by Joseph. Otherwise, he could have never gotten in. I mean, can you imagine... You say, you know, somebody says to you, hey, I've got a message for the President of the United States. Would you take this for me? You drive to Washington, you walk up to the White House, and you try to walk through the door to take the message to the Oval Office. Do you think you're going to get in? I suspect that you will be surrounded by a SWAT team immediately of all kinds of uh, agents in the Secret Service, and you'll be pulled aside, you'll be questioned, you, you'll be searched. Whoever this messenger was was a man who was known to Joseph and trusted by Joseph. He's carrying a message for the brothers. You know, sometimes, and we see many illustrations of this in Scripture, sometimes key people can be swept up in a plot that is designed for evil. For example, we have an illustration of that in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 15, where Absalom's treason against his father David is recorded. It says, Absalom sent spies throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, As soon as ye hear the sound of the trumpet, when ye shall say, Absalom reigneth in Hebron, and with Absalom went 200 men out of Jerusalem. Listen. 
With Absalom went 200 men out of Jerusalem that were called, and they went in their simplicity, and they knew not anything. You will discover that there are wicked people in the world who will try to use you for their own ends, and you have no idea what they are doing, and you think everything is above board, and everything is going well, and you are being used. Here's a messenger. We don't know whether he knew the truth or did not know the truth about his message, but he's being used by the brothers. You see, they sent a messenger first because they were fearful. They were personally afraid to ask for forgiveness without something preceding them. And you know, often our fear makes us afraid to ask forgiveness from the person whom we have wronged. We're afraid to ask someone to forgive us, maybe because we're afraid they won't forgive us. Maybe we're afraid to ask forgiveness because we know that if we come into their presence, they'll lash out and do something against us. Maybe we're afraid to ask for their forgiveness because we think, if I just let sleeping dogs lie, maybe they won't remember and maybe they won't do anything bad. Uh, we don't want to bring it up again. Fear in asking for forgiveness presents a roadblock, but there are other things in our lives that often present, present roadblocks that keep us from asking for forgiveness. And all of us have people that we need to ask, will you forgive me? What are some of the other roadblocks? Pride. Pride also bars the way to humbling ourselves and asking for forgiveness. Self-deception, where we think what we did wasn't so bad, and that keeps us from asking for forgiveness because we, we sort of shove it into that low category as it's not very important. It may have been very important for the one whom we harmed. You know, that's why we have our service of preparation the Friday evening before we take the Lord's table. Because it's not only so that we can ask the Lord's forgiveness, that takes place instantaneously, but it also gives us opportunity on the intervening day to go to those whom we have harmed, those against whom we have sinned, and ask for their forgiveness and try to make restitution before we come to the Lord's table. Oh, never consider that what you have done to harm someone else is a little thing, for in your mind it may be small, but in their mind it may be very, very large. Other things that keep us from asking forgiveness, sloth and procrastination keeps us from asking forgiveness, blame deflection where we cause ourselves to believe that someone else is more guilty than we are and so that person ought to go first and ask for forgiveness and as long as they don't go, well we're free not to have to go because after all someone is 60% responsible and we're only 40% responsible, although often we think ourselves less responsible even than that. We cause ourselves to think someone else more guilty. It should also be obvious, I think, that if the brothers had brought the message themselves to start with, Joseph would have had no reason to believe their message. <laughs> I think it obviously would have been very self-serving. The brothers march in, dad has died, they get back to Egypt, they walk in and say, by the way, dad told us to tell you you're supposed to forgive us. <laughs> that would have been very self-serving, that would have defeated their purpose. That's why they send this messenger. To say, jo Jacob said, please forgive your brothers. You see, what the brothers are ignoring, though, was the fact that Jacob had been alive for 17 years in Egypt. Jacob knew the facts of their wicked treatment of their brother. Jacob could have personally given that message to them at any time before he died. A guilty conscience and fear will keep you from thinking clearly. The Bible speaks to both those issues Proverbs chapter 28 verse 13 says, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. They're here trying to cover their sin. The second verse is 2 Timothy 1.7. They're doing it out of fear, but listen to what Paul tells us in 2 Timothy 1. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. You see, fear robs you of three things. It robs you of power, it robs you of love, and it robs you of a sound mind. Fear means that you will not think clearly. And obviously the brothers are not thinking clearly in this passage. 
The fourth lesson that we learn out of the text today is the sinful human heart knows that it needs forgiveness and it knows that the only ultimate source of forgiveness is God. Did you notice the mention of God as we were reading through that text? In verse 17, So shall ye say to Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and their sins, for they did thee evil, and now we pray thee, forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of thy father. Oh, that verse is really packed with a lot of stuff. But they are making the religious appeal. You know, we always try to put ourselves in the very best possible light whenever we are dealing with our own personal sin. Did you notice the first word that they use in the three words that are used for sin in this verse, the first word that they use is the word trespass. That's a gentler word for sin before stating the words sin and evil, which both are stated later in the verse, but they start off with trespass and they end with trespass. Now, I'm sure all of us have at one point or another, whether knowingly or unknowingly, trespassed on somebody else's property. We cut across a piece of private property that belonged to somebody else and we trespassed. You know. That was their private property, and we decided to take a shortcut. We trespassed. Now, I suspect, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I suspect that most of us here think that, ah, well, that wasn't so bad. I didn't do anything really harmful. I didn't, I mean, the grass, even if I scuff the grass a little bit, it'll grow back. <laughs> that's where the brothers start. But you know, that's not enough. Because then, as God puts pressure on them, they use the word sin, and they use the word evil. Not just the action which was bad against their brother, but something that came from the heart, from the evil, internal, old sin nature. And they use both of those words. I pray thee, a begging request, of course, theoretically from, jo uh, from Jacob, and then we get back to trespass after including sin and evil under that category. And then they say, after all, you know, these brothers, the servant of the God of your father. After all, they're, they, they, they're ones serving the right God, so you can't beat up on them too bad. Remember, remember, Joseph, God is watching you. Have you ever had a pagan, an unbeliever, try to use scripture on you, and they always quote it out of context. <laughs> you know, if, if you point out somebody is doing something that's wrong, have you ever heard them quote back to you, judge not lest ye be judged? <laughs> they do it, don't they? They don't know anything else in the Word of God except how to defend their own sins. And they take it out of context, and they use it so that they can continue on their way, and so they can hopefully shut you up, so that you aren't a nagging thorn in their side. That passage goes on, though. And it explains that the judgment you use to judge someone else will be the same kind of judgment that's used to judge you. It's not a prohibition against judgment. It's just making sure that before you say anything, your own act is together. But back to our text here. We see them here now trying to bring the religious pressure to bear. God is watching you. And then, finally, they play their big card, the God of thy father. Because, you see, they knew already Jacob's intense love for his father. His obedience to his father is what had gotten him in trouble in the first place because they hated the fact that he obeyed and they did not. But they knew Jacob loved his father. And they didn't need to bring any of these arguments because Joseph had already forgiven them. The bottom line is, just like those brothers, we know that we need forgiveness for sins. In our inner being, we know it. We know we need forgiveness for sins. Not only do we need forgiveness for sins, but the key issue is, will we confess our sins to our Heavenly Father and will we ask for His forgiveness? What about you? You know, there, there is an actual message for you and for me from our Heavenly Father. There is a message from our Father. 
He stands ready, He stands available to forgive us for our sins. The fifth lesson, when we use the human methods of trying to deal with sin, it causes sorrow to those who love us and who have already forgiven us. It says, and Joseph wept when they spake unto him. He saw through it. Oh, how clever we think we are when we think we're fooling somebody else. Joseph saw through it because Joseph was walking in fellowship with God. And he wept when they spoke unto him. When you and I use the human methods of trying to polish ourselves up, instead of coming to the one God, the only one who can forgive our sins, instead of doing that, we do the human thing. It causes great sorrow to those who love us. Lesson six. God often uses our fear of consequences to humble us, to force us to do what he has declared. We live a life that is unpleasing to him. We do things that we know we shouldn't have done. We suddenly begin to realize that there are going to be, you know, some repercussions from this. We know we're going to have to face some consequences for this. And it forces us to our knees. How good God is to allow us to go through that pressure so that it will bring us to the point where we realize we cannot do it on our own. Our life is a wipeout. It's a failure. But he brings us to our knees so that we will know that he is there and he is ready to forgive us. His brethren also went and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we be thy servants. They were humbled before Joseph. Their fear of consequences forced them to fall down on their face before him. Oh, you and I go through life and how often have we had to cry out to God, our sin has caused us to fall before him and say, oh God, forgive me for I have sinned. You know, as we look at that, we also are reminded of a very early event in the life of Joseph when he was only 17 years old. He had dreams and God prophesied through Joseph's dreams that his brothers would bow before him. And here we find them doing it again. For us, it is the will of God to use our circumstances to mold and shape us into the character likeness of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is why he brings us to the points of humbling. That is why he brings us through the fires. That is why he brings us through the, the tests and trials of life so that we might understand that we cannot do it on our own. You see, he has a design to make you have the character of Christ. Listen to what Paul says. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he, that is Christ, might be the firstborn among many brethren. You say, but the, it's painful going through that. Listen to what Peter says. The trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found under the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. God designs to mold you and shape you into the character image of his Son. The final lesson. All the evil things that happen to believers and they do happen to believers, are designed for three things. Yesterday I was talking to a classmate who has given up on God. He was a very articulate young man in defense of the gospel when he was in high school. And in the course of our conversation he made the comment, well Christians get hit by buses too. And I said, yes, they do. Because we live in a world that's been cursed by sin, by suffering, by death, and by pain. It's not a perfect world. 
But for the Christian, to be absent from the body is to be home with the Lord. And we do not understand God's reasons. We do not understand God's ways, but we know because his word declares it, and we have his promise that he's working all things together for our good, for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. The three things. He does all these things even when they seem painful for our good, and the painful things are to purify the sin in our own lives. Number two, he does them for his own glory, though we may not understand it. And number three, he does it for the ultimate salvation, preservation, and provision for his own elect. We have a God who is there. Listen to what Joseph says in verses 19 through 21. Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, you thought evil against me. But God meant it unto good, to bring to pass as it is this day, to save much people alive. Now therefore fear ye not, I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. Dear friends, people all around us have been wounded and scarred by sin. They don't understand the forgiveness and the healing power of the grace of God. And they need exactly the same three things that Joseph brought to his brothers here. They need the message, fear not, because there is hope in Christ. They need the promise of help from those who love them. I will nourish you. They need comfort and kindness. And he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. Only when we understand the heart of what Joseph said can we experience those three things for ourselves. And only then can we share those things with others. What do we need to understand? We need to understand first our place and God's place in dealing with those who have harmed us. You've got to get his position straight and your position straight. He says, am I in the place of God? You see, there's no room for a personal vendetta. There is no room for a complaint against God. God is God and I am man. And God is the one who is in charge. If he wants to do something about it, he can well do something about it. Am I in the place of God? First, we need to understand our place and God's place in dealing with those who have harmed us. Secondly, there has to be an honest evaluation of the facts that we have to deal with emotionally. Oh, when someone hurts us, old sin nature raises up. I'll give you an illustration of that. Personal. Yesterday, driving out... I went across the Verrazano Narrows Bridge to get across Long Island. I had no idea that bridge cost so much. <laughs> it cost $12 going out and $13 coming back just for that bridge. But to add insult to injury, as I pulled up to the bridge the first time to pay my toll of $12, I had the exact change. And the window on the Suburban doesn't come down, or if it does come down, you can't get it back up. The motor pushing it up doesn't work. So it only has a space about this big at the top. So I had stuck my hand with the money outside the space, within perhaps six inches to a foot from where the toll booth operator was taking the money. And he just sat and looked at me. He says, I can't reach that. <laughs> you know what came up inside me like, you've got to be kidding me, you're getting paid to do this? <laughs> but uh, anyway, so I pulled it back in, opened the car door, and stuck it around the edge of the car door to him. He reaches out with a lackadaisical hand to take it and drops the $10 bill. Takes the, the $2 and drops the $10. And then looks nonchalantly down at the ground where it had blown up in front of the car. <laughs> you know, the devil was tempting me. I could have said something, but I didn't. Instead of smiled, opened the door, got out of my car. There's a huge line behind me. Walked up to the $10 reel, picked it up, 
handed it to him. I said, may I have a receipt, please? He didn't move. I said, may I have a receipt, please? He finally gives me a receipt. Get back in the car, put the seatbelt on, drive away. You know, when people do things that irritate us, don't we want to respond in some way? Failure here is sin. You know, the love of our Lord Jesus Christ has forgiven us far greater evils than that. Honest evaluation of the facts that we have to deal with emotionally. Ye thought evil against me. Joseph had to deal with all that was packaged in that. How did he deal with it? How do we deal with it? There is personal accountability. There is responsibility for sin. But the question is for us as believers, how are we going to deal with it? Joseph has the heavenly, eternal viewpoint. God meant it unto good. You see, the only way that pleases God that we can deal with it when someone else has hurt us is we have to look above the horizon of time, which is very short. We need to look into eternity, which lasts forever. And then, here's a scary one. As fearful as it seems, we must acknowledge the fact that God is sovereign and he could have ordained a different set of events. Have you ever stopped to think about that? God could have ordained a different set of events. Until you come to grips with that in your spirit, you will lead a miserable life. God is sovereign. He could have chosen a different set of events. He could have chosen a different course of history. He could have chosen a different thing to happen in your life. That's where most people get off the boat. But you see, Joseph didn't. Look at that next phrase. God meant it unto good. That's particularly painful when something really horrible happens in our lives. God meant it unto good. It's really hard when we've lost a job. It's really hard when we've lost a loved one. It's very hard if you lose a child. God meant it unto good. The next thing, if you don't ever move beyond that, you're going to have problems. But the next thing that we learn here is that to gain peace and fellowship, we must believe the fact that God is not capricious. God has a perfect purpose in time and in history for those things that we suffer. Look at that phrase, to bring to pass as it is this day. You can't live the past again. You haven't lived the future yet. You don't even know if God's going to give it to you. To bring to pass as it is this day. Where do you sit this day? To bring to pass as it is this day day. And God is not capricious. And finally, we must understand that we will never know all of the answers in advance. The fact that we don't know the details of God's purpose while we're going through the trials, and yet it is a glorious purpose that may span many generations. Look at that last phrase, to save much people alive. God had a purpose in it that was a good purpose even though Joseph, the only faithful son of Jacob, had to be the one that suffered the trials. It was a good purpose for those rascal brothers who had done all the evil things to him because God had made a promise to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. God never goes back on his promises. A message from your father. Joseph 
heard a message claiming to be from his father, whether spoken by Jacob or not, it was a true message, for it was a message of forgiveness. Our Heavenly Father has that same message for us. We're sinners, we're guilty, we're vile, we're condemned, we're undone before God and we're headed for hell. And Christ came into the Egypt of this world and suffered and died for our sins. He rose from the dead, he offers forgiveness to you through the blood of his cross, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, Ephesians 1.7 and Colossians 1.14. Have you ever come to Christ? Oh, there may be somebody here who has never truly come to Christ. You can't come by cleaning yourself up first. You come to Jesus as you are. And he has infinite mercy and pardon, and he will give you peace. Oh, listen to what the word of God declares. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. And I will cleanse them from all their iniquity, whereby they have sinned against me. And I will pardon all their iniquities, whereby they have sinned and whereby they have transgressed against me. Pardon, I beseech thee, the iniquity of this people, according to the greatness of thy mercy. And as thou hast forgiven this people from Egypt even until now. When you come, you will hear the words of Jesus. You will experience what Jesus promised. Peace, I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. The brothers were filled with fear. Two chapters later, Jesus says, These things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you that our Lord Jesus Christ died for our sins. How we thank you that he was buried and the third day he was raised from the dead according to the scriptures. How we thank you that as we come to him in faith, he gives us eternal life. How we thank you that it is by grace we are saved through faith. And that not of ourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Father, we pray that if there is even one person here this day who has never trusted in Christ alone to forgive his or her sins, that this very day they might fall before the foot of our Lord Jesus Christ as the brothers fell before Joseph, that they might fall before the foot of the cross, that they might understand that Jesus shed his blood for them, that he died in their place, that he bore their sins, that he offers them full cleansing and forgiveness. And that, Father, you would open their eyes as only you can do. That you would cause them to trust in him alone and not lean upon their own works or spend all their time in fear and worry about their sin, but know that Christ has forgiven them. That they might pray this day, Father, forgive me even as Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Oh, Father, move in the hearts of those present today that we who are believers might also confess our sins, that we might not stuff them, that we might not try to deal with them in a human way, but that we might use the provision which you have made if we confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father, we commit these things to you in the name of our blessed Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our closing